Okay, now we are live on the sixth meeting. And uh, today we are talking about uh, realizability, um, mainly the period of realizability before the invention of uh, topos theory, basically. So there are two main periods of realizability theory. So starting in 1945, we have cleaning realizability, which is the main topic, uh, formalized realizability, modified realizability. And we'll try to touch upon what that those are good for today. And uh, there's a lot of uh, philosophical discussion included in Beeson's book, uh, which we are re reading from. And it's kind of fun to read through these dialogues. And we can try to uh, try to have a look and see if you agree with the various uh, disputants in those uh, discussions. Uh, that's for today. And for next time, um, we are talking about then the other part of the main thing we want to get out of having something constructively proven or intuitionistically proven. So I mentioned there are two things we would like to have out. One thing is uh, things that are effective and recursive. So if something is constructive, it should be recursively uh, computable from the parameters or something like that. And the other thing is continuity. Uh, if something is constructively derivable, we expect it to be continuous in various parameters. And so another class of things we want to dis discuss is uh, continuous models. That's next week. And then we'll have the break and then student presentations. OK. So um, realizability. And, and we talked in the first meeting about the proof interpretation. And obviously, in hindsight, it looks like it's a way of making that precise. Uh, but that was not actually Kleene's original idea. Kleene's idea was um, to think of formulas in intuitionistic logic as conveying incomplete statements. So an existence statement is not a complete communication, but it's something that we can complete by saying what it is that exists together with this, the head that has the property that it has. So it's just a sort of historical remark. Uh, but the idea is we want to generalize this from pure existence statements to all formulas and try to get out the missing information of communication that we have when we prove something uh, constructively or intuitionistically. OK, so that's the motivation. And then the way things are set up in Beeson um, is it's formalized in this theory EON. So that's why I asked you to at least look at the first sections of chapter 6 about theories of rules and uh, partial combinatorial algebras. So let's go to um, this section one. Maybe I want to ask you first if you have any, uh, any comments before we start going into it or anything that struck you. So the first section deals with the logic of partial terms. Um, and this, this is a very useful formalism for abstracting away the working with recursive indices. So when, when we discuss cleaning realizability, we will eventually talk a lot about this index of a Turing machine when applied to this number, as may be expressed on a tape, um, produces a computation that halts, and the output is some other finite piece of tape which represents a number. Okay. But we want to abstract this situation to make it a little bit easier. And this is what we do with the logic of partial terms, where we say we can apply one term to another term, and it may not produce a final value. It may not uh, halt. And uh, thus, we introduce uh, some improvements on first order logic, so to speak. Um, let me just make, make some notes on LPT. So this is the logic of partial terms. And the main thing is we introduce a new uh, atomic formula where t is a term. And this is a formula stating that uh, t is defined, has a value. OK. And um, the way we set things up in the logic of partial terms, there are other versions of logic with partiality. In this setup, variables will always be defined. And if a predicate holds of some terms, it will imply, uh, if an atomic predicate holds, it will imply that the terms that are predicated 
will be defined. So there's a strictness involved. And likewise for functions, if a, a compound term is defined, every subterm will also be defined. So it embodies in computer science speak an evaluation order that uh, somehow you evaluate arguments before you evaluate functions. So for some applications, this may not be desirable, but for purely mathematical investigations, it's usually fine to, to have the strictness built in. Okay, so then we introduce a, um, an abbreviation, which was typically used informally. So R and S are terms, and say they're equivalent to each other. So by definition means that if either R is defined or S is defined, then they're both defined and they're equal. So if one side is defined and so is the other, and they have the same value. So this is a very useful abbreviation when working with uh, computations that may not halt. So we want to just say, okay, if it halts, then it's the value can be computed by something else. Okay, and then uh, there's a, an axiomatization. Yeah. Um, when you set R equals S, but you set R and S are both defined and they're equal. Yes, so because the meaning of equals has changed now. The meaning of well, yeah, we have to we have to say what the meaning of equal is and things that are possibly yeah. not defined. And I say for all atomic predicates, of which I take equality to be one, mm -hmm. if an atomic predicate holds, it implies that uh, the things that are predicated are defined. Okay. Okay. So we take this to mean so any any atomic predicate, including equality, this means that. R and S are defined and they have the same value. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, you know, warning maybe. Uh, so, is that why I, maybe I've seen also X equals X for the statement that X is defined as that related to this? Yeah, that's, well, this would be Dana's, uh, Dana Scott's um, E logic, okay. which is an, another way of talking about uh, things that might be partial. But in E logic, it's a. This is also mentioned in the in this chapter by Beeson. It's a philosophical difference, and uh, it's a different idea. So in E logic, uh, variables denote possibly undefined things, and you can existence is then a predicate. So here, this is not really saying that T exists. This is saying T is defined. Whereas, and, and in the logic of partial terms, we will always have X equals X because uh, variables are taken to be defined or ranging over defined things. And so this will be an axiom, one of the equality axioms. We have to change the equality axioms a little bit to account for the interpretation. And in E logic, it would be different. In E logic, you could define this to mean E of X, that X has existence at that point. So in some sense, E logic is a little bit better for the topos theory, uh, but um, LPT has some other advantages. Okay. Yeah. So you mean that equality on the right hand side is is defined through a lot of axioms and rules? Is that, is that yeah. Right? So the, the, they are defined in this uh, in this chapter. We can we can go oh, through. Uh, yeah. Uh, for now, I just want to give <coughs> the main ideas. But note this strictness idea implies you have to be a little bit careful about negated and compound uh, formulas, right? Because to say that not R equals S. This might hold, for instance, if one of R and S are undefined. Okay, and you might then introduce another thing. And you might you might have a primitive not equals thing, which means that if uh, that that they are both defined and not equal, and this would be different from the negation of equality. So this you know so these two things are not equal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They are both defined. <laughs> yeah, that all formulas. If you want all formulas that fine, they're not terms. They're just they're a different syntactic class. Okay, so that's a warning about what working with the system. You have to, uh, if you're a beginner with this, might might get you uh, get you tripped up. Okay. Um, yeah. Then then there's an axiomatization given. Um, I guess we can. Scroll down and have a look. Um, so, I mean, the main things you have to change besides the rules for equality is the rules for the quantifiers. And um, so, uh, Beeson gives the Hilbert style rules. So, how do you uh, introduce 
uh, universal and extended power bias, now you eliminate, you could also give them a natural deduction style formulation. And what you would have to change, for instance, is the um, for all the limb rule, right? So the usual for all the limb rule would say something like this if uh, for all x, a of x, then a of t for any term t, right? This is for all the limb. Uh, but to account for the fact that terms may not be defined and variables are supposed to range only over defined objects, we'd have to add another another premise, namely we have to also derive that t is defined. That's a question about the warning again. So yeah. if r is undefined, is the negation of r equals s, is that a true statement? That's true, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, okay. That's the, 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 the point. Yeah, that's yeah. the point. Okay. Okay. So we changed the quantifier rules. You also have to change the uh, rules for the uh, for the existence. I mean, to introduce, and uh, I guess I can write it down, exists intro. Uh, usually, it would just be if you've proven a of t, then you know that there exists an x a of x. But now, in this case, this is not enough because you also have to check that t is defined. So is it in this logic that if you apply a primitive operation to the right number of variables, that it is always a defined thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we don't have uh, don't have an equality, for example, which can be undefined. Or, or uh, no, no, I mean yeah. that's that's the reason to introduce this this, this symbol yeah. to have this uh, so usual compound formula, not an atomic formula. So there are also some equality axioms. I don't think we have to do to do them, but I mean, usually, maybe oh, let's do one of them. Usually, for equality, you would have that if r is equal to s and a of r, then a of s, right? Um, but here, it's more useful to have it in the form in this form. So that turns out to be the right thing to do in, in the logic of partial terms. <coughs> um, okay. And then, so the strictness axioms follow that, and that's basically what happens in uh, in section one. And it ends with the remark comparing exactly LPT with E logic, uh, which is, as I mentioned, Scott's um, Scott's way of doing it. Uh, then there are some exercises to this section, which basically uh, give an argument for how you could always reduce this to ordinary first order logic by um, having an extra, um, instead of getting rid of the function symbols and having the function symbols be represented by a relation that is a graph, and then you can translate uh, this way. And that also gives you a soundness and completeness theory for at least the classical version of this logic. And once you have it for the classical version, you can do the same thing, except we haven't really done Kripke models. But if we had done Kripke models, we would also get soundness and completeness classically for the Kripke models for this uh, logic. OK. So that's not so important. It's just maybe important to know about. And then section two is um, where we'll be doing the realizability. So this is uh, the targets for realizability. This is, uh, these are combinatorial algebras, so partial combinatorial algebras. And as I said, the idea is to abstract from the relation of um, recursive uh, computation, and so just say what are the what are the the, the formal apparatus needed to uh, to talk about recursion theory, and um, so we just take uh, we say that a partial combinatorial algebra with now a partial binary operation of application, and then we want to uh, constants k and s. So these, this is the logic of partial terms. Sometimes I miss Germany. I had uh, actually washed the board. So. So I take a set M 
God is a partial binary operation. And then you want constants k and s. Uh, let's just say that k is different from s. So two elements. And um, so these are traditional combinators. I'm sure you have seen them before. But just mind you how we formalize it here. So k, x, y is defined and equal to x for all x. And 2 s, x, y is always defined. And s, x, y, c is x, y, c. And here's uh, some con syntactic conventions that are in use. So instead of writing the dot, we just write juxtaposition. And juxtaposition associates to the left. So this means k dot x, parenthesis dot y. Right? And um, yeah, so. The last equality is uh, different. Oh, thank you. This has to be the weak equality. Yeah, I noted the syntactic conventions. Okay. And then you can take this in two ways. You can say this is a purely semantical thing. Uh, we define a PCA to be just the structure. But in fact, the way we set things up is we also have a theory PCA now in both phase, such that the, the PCAs are exactly the models in terms of this the logic of partial terms of this theory, which has two constants and uh, these axioms. And um, now again, the, the main things to note here are the, uh, first of all, the combinatorial completeness. Uh, let's put that in here. So this means that we can define lambda abstraction. And there are many different algorithms, but so what does it mean to define lambda abstraction? It means that for any term t in a variable x, you can define a new term lambda xt such that lambda xt is always a defined term. And the variables are the variables of t minus x. And furthermore, um, when you apply it to x, that may or may not be defined, but it has the same value as t if t is defined at x. Don't you want strict equality also in the defining clause for S? Uh, no. Since now S could be... No. In, fact, in fact, one thing you could do, sometimes you have something that's even weaker than a partial combinatorial algebra where even this well, is not well, always... S is everywhere undefined. That's, called, that's a partial combinatorial algebra. As no. everywhere. No. Ah, you, ah, that is, uh, yeah, okay. Right. That's the purpose of this. Yeah. But you can weaken this a little bit. Sometimes you want a model where this is not quite true, but uh, I don't remember the exact formulations of the weakenings. But it's true that you can play a little bit with this part, but you need something like this in order to have it be non trivial. Yeah. Uh, isn't it essential to require that K and S are different? Uh, yeah, that's yeah. equal, and uh, the, the partial combinatorial algebra contains only k. Yeah, then everything well, yeah, is equal. I understand that if they are equal, then it's trivial, but do we require them to be unequal? Yes. You could you could do it otherwise, then, I mean, it's a little bit of a, uh, I mean, maybe it's a, an aesthetic thing. But I do want to have this result, which would not hold for the trivial uh, partial combinatorial algebra, which is um, the representation theorem. Um, but to talk about the representation theorem, so the way we first would just prove the recursion theorem. So the recursion theorem means that we have a combinator, say R, such that for any F, F is just a term, right? I think of it as a, as a function. I want to take the fixed point out. So this is always defined. And um, one way to phrase it is if, if G is the result, um, then for all X, uh, GX 
is weak equal to f g d x. So this is a, it's a recursion theorem. So f is some, some operation that can take um, some other function, and we want to take, take the fixed point of this application. OK, so once you have uh, this fixed point operator, and in the form of this, this recursion theorem, and the, the proof is the same thing. You just write down um, the term with some self-application. Just a two-line proof as usual. But it works in this framework. Um, now we can start representing um, um, primitive recursive functions and the partial recursive functions. And then it's a theorem, at least in the case where k is different from s, that um, you have a representation of numerals, and every partial recursive function is numeral-wise representable in any PCA. And of course, if you allow the trivial PCA, then it would be numeral-wise representable in any non-trivial PCA. Okay. That's the idea about the non-triviality, I think. Uh, OK. And then there's a little bit of discussion of models. Um, so uh, the first model is the one, the, the intended one, or maybe with an oracle that could be useful sometimes. So um, that's called Cleaney's first model. Uh, you could also take um, some other kinds of, uh, of functions on numbers, say the pi 1 1 functions. Uh, or you could take the intended model, but as interpreted in a non standard model of arithmetic, that could also be useful. So th those are some. Some of the models that I mentioned in section two. Later on in the chapter, I guess we'll come back to it later, um, there are a bunch of other models. Uh, Scott's model of the lambda calculus, the infinities of PCA. Uh, there are set theoretic models. Uh, there's Kleene's second model uh, for continuity. So we'll come back to those later, I guess. So for now, let's just finish off this chapter by going to the discussion section. Um, uh, I didn't ask you to read it, but we can have a, we can skim over it together. Um, so this is section ten um, of the chapter, and so this is a philosophical point. Um, and the the question is whether um, oh I suppose I should, well let me back up. I had some more in the notes. So, um, let me just say. The, the basic theory PCA is, uh, is, is good for many purposes, but for um, we want something that has a bit of induction as well. And to formulate that, it's useful to have this strengthening of PCA to call PCA plus in Beeson, where you have um, pairing and projections as primitive operations, and you have the natural numbers with zero and successor as primitive operations. You could define them uh, church style or something like that, but it's very convenient to have them as primitives. And uh, then you can have the theory EON, so the elementary theory of operations and numbers, which is this is PCA plus, uh, plus induction for all formulas in the language over the natural numbers. And this is a theory that obviously contains high things arithmetic. So when we prove something is consistent with EON, uh, it will also be consistent with HA. And if, uh, EUN doesn't prove something, then Heitzing arithmetic also doesn't prove this something, whatever it is. So that's why this EON is a useful theory. OK, so now the question is, um, is EON a, a good constructive theory? Is it a theory of constructive mathematics, if we take it with uh, the constructive logic of partial terms? And the reason I'm asking this is because most of the theories that I guess many people are used to are theories of total operations. And there we have an idea that once we have convinced ourselves that something is a function, we can apply it to any argument and be sure to get an answer. In something like EON, you can make an application of something that's just some rule which may not be a rule that terminates at all. And it, it should make sense to make this application. But is that a constructive thing in this case? I want to open that for discussion. Maybe we can read a bit about what um, 
uh, why don't we just read it together? So uh, how many have a copy of the texts open? Uh, Ronia and Colin and Flores. OK, so. Yes, yeah, six point ten. So the page number is one forty five. Which is now sixteen Have you found it? You have it? Yeah. Okay. So we need we need a skepticus, we need a Fyodor, we need a significus. Uh, I think that's uh, that's enough for now. So okay. Uh, who would like to be the skepticus? Sure. Okay, Floris is skepticus. Who would like to be Fyodor? Okay, Ryan is Florida. And uh, Significus? Maybe Colin? Well, this section is actually omitted from the Google Books version. Oh, it's omitted from the Google Books version. Uh, how about, Ekpa, do you have this? Uh, okay. okay. Well, first time it. Okay, Evan is, uh, Evan is Significus. Okay, so <coughs> Skepticus. Go ahead. An author, he can go on the whole afternoon proving meta -meta medical theorems about this theory EON without ever once stopping to consider if this theory, <clears throat> if this is a theory with any meaning for constructive mathematics. I, for one, don't see why we should consider this theory. It seems to me that the only model of EON which is at all related to basic constructive notions is K1, the notion of partial recursive indices. This does make a certain amount of sense if you accept Markov's philosophy, but in that case, we might as well be content with Heiting's arithmetic, which is perfectly adequate to formalize the theory of recursive functions. Okay, I agree. In fact, I believe Markov's <coughs> principle is the only coherent theory of rules. Rules are recursive rules, period. Nobody has ever exhibited another kind of rule, and nobody ever will. Constructive mathematics is naturally and by that I mean to imply adequately and faithfully formalized in HA plus CT naught. Or maybe in HA, Asian arithmetic with certain stronger notions of church's themes. Let me try to overcome these objections uh, by sketching an informal model of the OAN. <coughs> by a rule, I mean a list of instructions which can be followed by a human being on a big list, so to speak, a person program as opposed to a computer program. There is an operation app given by the following rule. Accept two inputs, f and x. Apply, or try to apply, f to x. If there is a result, that is the output. It is easy to define operations playing the roles of the combinators k and s. This argument cannot be extended to justify c <coughs> since we don't have a rule to find the recursive index of each person program. It seems to me that with this model in mind, EON is the most natural theory of rules and is adequate and faithful. I don't agree with Fyodor that Markov's philosophy ought to be accepted. I'm willing to accept some less precisely described notion of rule and recursive index. But let us see if f can bring itself, such that f of x equals f of x. First of all, we should try to be a little more precise about how the rule is given. It has to be a list of instructions. Each instruction has to call for some precise behavior. No free choices or random processes are to be called for, and no judgments or creativity. I should allow judgments. That is precisely what humans can do that machines so far cannot. Let us leave that in suspension for now and see where the argument leads us. Consider trying to perform FFX <coughs> according to the instruction significance has given. We accept inputs F and X. We check to see if F is a list of instructions. Well, it looks like a list of instructions, but we have to check that no random processes, creativity, etc., will be needed. That will require us, at the very minimum, to understand the instructions for F, and very probably to make a judgment that these instructions are acceptable. 
So it seems that if we are to accept EON, we must accept uh, either accept CT as well, or we must allow understanding and judgments as processes in the execution of rules. The argument, incidentally, is unaffected if someone suggests that we not decide that that we not decide all at once whether the list of instructions giving F is acceptable, but only try to execute the instructions executing only the acceptable steps. Exactly. We must accept CT or else allow judgments and understanding as humanly computable processes. And I maintain that we should allow them as epitomizing the difference between a human and a Turing machine. I certainly don't think we should allow such vaguely defined mental <coughs> processes in mathematical objects. Constructivity was originally motivated by the desire to keep mathematics free of metaphysics and meaning of existence. Now we see it is in danger of becoming hopelessly involved with psychology if, if significance has its way. On the contrary, it is very much in the mathematical tradition to define a concept precisely which has been previously described in vague, semi-psychological terms. That is exactly the situation here. Previously, we had no choice but to accept such descriptions of rule as significance and skepticism offered. But now that the concept of recursive function is known, we ought to recognize that it makes precise what we mean by rule, at least modular codings of objects or their descriptions as integers. Markov algorithms don't even require this latter proviso. You cannot banish judgments entirely from constructive mathematics. Consider the statement that f is a function from end to end. If we accept Church's thesis, this has the form for all n exists k, t, f, and k. Before we accept this as true, we must have a proof of it. To accept the statement as meaningful is to believe that we have the capability of judging when this statement is correctly proved. Thus, judgments will enter into the concept of a function from end to end, whether or not we accept CT. Of course, we cannot banish judgments from mathematics entirely. But we should certainly not regard them as mathematical objects or instructions to be manipulated like integers or other concrete objects. We should reject F as an operation, but we should not adopt CT either. If you're going to banish F, then it seems to me that you will have difficulty to construct even the following very simple operation F of type 2, F of little f equals little f of 0. For to compute F of little f, you have to apply F to 0. But surely this operation is indispensable and clear, yet it seems no easier to justify than the general operation of that. This seems at first to be a puzzling point, but I have thought it out, and I think the following explanation will satisfy you. Your f applies to functions f mapping n to, into n, not to unordered rules. A function is a rule, together with the evidence that it always yields an integer value, an integer argument. If we are presented with this evidence in advance, there will be no need to make judgments in carrying out instructions apply f to zero. So f is given by a rule. And this reasoning itself is the evidence that f of f is defined for every f mapping n to n. So that f itself is actually a function of type 2. Your point is clear. App for functions is not the same problem as app for operations, since <coughs> functions come equipped with evidence they are well defined. This argument suggests the possibility of a coherent theory of functions without a general application operation. That's right. In every case of sets A and B to the A, there will be an a evaluation map from B to the A times A into A to B. <coughs> By an argument like the one above. <coughs> but with operations, there will be difficulties, unless the general app operation is justified somehow. On the other hand, functions have domains, which are sets. So it doesn't make sense to consider theories of functions unless you can also discuss sets in the theory. The theory H A, A omega gets around this objection by discussing only certain fixed sets, the finite types, so that no variables for the sets are needed. But then it is automatically unable to discuss even functions whose, whose domain are subsets of these fixed sets. The sort of theory needed to go beyond H A omega is not scheduled for discussion on the, until the <laughs> chapter on theories of rules, sets, and classes. And if you begin discussing it now, the other will be displeased. <laughs> Do I understand your point correctly? You claim that there is no coherent theory of operations as opposed to functions. 
which accepts the axioms for K and S, that is, accepts the idea that app is itself an operation. That's it in a nutshell. But you have our stated my case. I don't wish to claim that EOM is incoherent. It has far too many beautiful models to be incoherent. I only claim that it is not faithful to any constructive theory of rules, unless we, one wishes to assume church's thesis, or to allow judgments as mathematical objects, constituents of rules. That's a considerably weaker claim than incoherent. Sometimes it's very difficult for me to keep my patience with you two and your interminable discussions over judgments, when neither of you can say what one is with any more precision than I can. I shall never understand your unwillingness to simply accept the facts. Rules are recursive. As Markov pointed out, having this precise characterization of rules makes possible a precise foundation of logic. He had in mind something like Clayney's realizability. EON is the natural setting or the study of realizability. It contains enough theory of rules to do recursive logic without un any unnecessary complications or restrictions. That alone is enough to make EOM worth studying. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, so by the way, I've uh, noticed that there are a couple of misprints in this book. So if you look through the proofs and discuss and discover that oh, it doesn't make any sense, it might be because of a misprint. Uh, I've tried to find a list of errata for the book, but so far I haven't found a good list. But uh, just be aware that, I mean, it has many good discussions and introductions of these things, but there are some misprints in the proofs. So occasionally if something makes no sense, it's not necessarily because uh, you are confused. It might be because of the, the, the book being confused. Okay. So with that said, what do you make of this discussion? Do you agree with, uh, with any of them? Particularly, I mean, I wasn't here two weeks ago when um, when Frank discussed uh, verification and judgment and proof and proposition. Um, but it has something to do with this discussion, I think, right? And also, the very first thing we discussed was the meaning of implication in constructive mathematics, right? We have to have a rule that maps a proof of A into a proof of B, possibly together with some evidence that this rule makes sense and does as it's supposed to do. Uh, so what do you, what do you think? It's certainly something we can come back to uh, when we discuss, I mean, I hope we will get to various kinds of type theories uh, of Martin Luff style. Uh, it's one of the dividing lines between something like computational type theory uh, in New Pearl and uh, more formal type theories, uh, whether we want to have a universe of all operations where there's a universal application operation where it makes sense to apply things to themselves or whether we want to carve out from the out of thin air or from basic ingredients but without never having without ever having a, a self application anywhere in the picture but only making functions out of rules when we know those rules make sense so those are two different approaches to theories of rules, and certainly the debate has gone on <laughs> for many years about which which one is the right one. Uh, so I have a question yeah. on this side. Uh, what's the rules of the name field? Of? Because for other two names, I feel being exact. Oh, I think he's just taking to be your, your, your Russian disciple of Markov. Oh. You can even, uh, maybe you should take him to be Sergei, um, uh, like Sergei Maslov, the guy who wrote the Constructivist's Hymn. <laughs> we talked, when we talked about Russian Constructivism, we mentioned the Constructivist's Hymn, which was written by a student of Shannon, um, himself was a, in Markov, uh, you know, one of the main uh, workers in Markov School of Constructive Mathematics. and. Um, the, uh, the chorus is like, algorithms will solve all our problems and prove all the theorems, except where there are no algorithms, right? So this is the point of view that in 
constructed mathematics or in mathematics, we should concern ourselves only with those rules that are given by algorithms. And in fact, we should take them as purely syntactic objects. So everything is a string over some alphabet so that you can read on a computer. And some of those are algorithms. And that's it. That's the, the Russian philosophy. In a, in it a might sense. be a teaser. It could be that, that, that uh, Marco had the, the most devoted student was some Fyodor and that beats and knows him. Oh, that could be. That could, see that we could yeah. check the, yeah. the students of uh, Marco if there was a Fyodor. Yeah. But otherwise, it's a generic. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I imagine that it's not meant to single any one particular person no, out, uh, but it, it meant to be a uh, representative. Yeah, yes, the exactly. representative of yeah, the uh, of the school. Generic uh, Russian name. Yeah, yeah. and uh, of course, skepticus is is clear something who is skeptical. And uh, I mentioned in the beginning that there was a, a, a Brouwer uh, was part of the Signifische Kring in the Netherlands, and mm -hmm. I take uh, Significus to be a representative of this school, uh, the philosophical school of Signifix. Okay. Um, Let's take a break before we uh, then use EON to do realizability. So let's take a five minute break. <clears throat> I never got around to looking this up. Did anybody, so is there, does there exist a classification of all PCAs, or is there a single PCA that rules uniquely determine a PCA, or are there many that they've been classified? Uh, oh, this this has certainly been studied, and I don't know the full thing. But when people started to do categorical realizability, they were very interested in trying to find. I mean, what we need to categorize here: you you don't want objects only; you also want morphisms between them, and uh, you want the construction of the realizability topos to be a functor on the, on the underlying PCA. And this was uh, achieved, I think, by taking a morphism of PCAs to be an internal. PCA uh, model of the first one in the second one, something like that. I, I don't remember the details, but uh, and then in terms of classifications, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I probably that many many doesn't find that at all. There's a few of rough. Yes, two. Uh, uh, well, maybe, maybe. I found a Fyodor share but. Or something, but that doesn't. Uh, he was a logician. Oh, oh, yeah. So, yeah. I think we're officially overthinking the other thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, now, now it's. Uh, <laughs> now we're officially overthinking it. Yeah, the, the Markov we're talking about is Markov Jr. Not the same. Yeah. No, so I'm trying to figure out. So, if Frodo is a student of Marco, then is that the junior one? There would be the junior one, or it would be possibly. A, I think Shannon had more students. Possibly a student of Shannon. Okay. <laughs> I think generic would be able to find that there are two models. I would probably put money, I think I would put money on it just being a generic name. Yeah, and, generic. Um, I, I, that doesn't get severely overthought. You could yeah. write a piece in an email too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, I can search the old name. <laughs> At least there were a lot of examples. <laughs> and and yes. Fjodor and Adrian van Shannon. Those two, yes. So, Wait, it's not this one? No. It's, there's one N and then I N. S H A N I N. No. Shannon. Nikolai. Yeah. So he had a lot of students. There's Sergei Maslov who wrote the letter. Yes. Grisha, Red Cloud. But no Fioros. Okay. <laughs> 
No, I, I, I didn't. No, I think it's on purpose. It's not the first name of one of the actual students in the school, but it's a recognizably Russian name that could be a representative of the school. What is it about the German chalkboards? That well, because there you have a you have water and a squeegee, uh, so you can actually make you don't have this. You can get a clean at every iteration. So I thought we were creating like either once a week or something. Uh, here, yeah. I mean, right now it's, it was clean before we started, but now it's. <laughs> oh, if that is the biggest thing you miss from Germany, I don't think it's too bad. No, I also, I also <laughs> miss uh, Schweinshaxe, of course. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so let's continue. Uh, now we are on chapter seven, uh, reliability. Um, so I mentioned already what's in the introduction, the motivations of Kleene. It was not actually to do this proof interpretation thing, it was to uh, extract a complete communication from the incomplete communication that we think we have when we prove something constructively. Um, so let's just go to the definition from section one. So for every formula of EUN, or from basically that's a formula that you can formulate in PCA plus, you uh, associate another formula. So you go from A to if E realizes A. So the idea is that the term E should represent the more complete message carried by A. But the, the important thing about this is you could do this just in the informal model of Kleene's first model, but we get a lot of benefits from actually formalizing it and picking a particular formula of EON as the interpretation. But, but that's important for, for getting some uh, metamathematical results. So here's, uh, here's how it goes. So here, what is A? Uh, what is E realizes A? So if A is atomic, in this case, we just take uh, A itself. Um, so, and I should say that E is supposed to be a fresh variable that doesn't have to occur, but it may occur uh, in, in this new formula, E realizes A. So for atomic formulas, we don't do anything. We say that the content is entirely carried by the atomic formula itself. And then sort of the, we go straight to the important, one of the important cases of an implication. And here we say for all Q, if Q realizes A, then E applied to Q is defined, and EQ realizes E. So did the first case has an important consequence that if A is true, any E realizes yeah, A. That's right. A, yeah. And if A is false, no, no E realizes, realizes A. A. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> That's important to know. Um, I just want to make one note about uh, this thing. If you were interpreting this in uh, Kleene's first model, you could, of course, unpack this. So for any argument Q, then you have this other formula, uh, maybe formalized in Heitzing's arithmetic. And then you would say there exists a computation uh, such that T of E, Q in this computation verifies that E applied to Q terminates. And then U of this computation 
is a realizer of these. So that's how you would uh, formalize it if you went straight to Cleaney's first model. And that's how you would get Cleaney 45 realizability. But here we are keeping it from EON to EON, and we can vary the models as we go along. Okay. And furthermore, this is nice because we don't have to deal with the T and the U operations. So that's nice. Then uh, for all X, A, uh, this is for all X, E, X is defined, and E, X realizes A. So here now, X may appear A. Okay. Exists X. So there are different conventions. Beeson takes the, uh, so it's a, it has to be a pair of, um, of an X that, and then a realizer for uh, A at that, uh, that X. Uh, and of course you have to pick which order that these things come in. And here the first P0 is, takes the first projection. So P0 of E should realize A of um, E1 of E. So the second component is the, uh, the witness, and the first component is the realizer. Sometimes you will find in the literature that it's swapped, obviously. Um, then for a conjunction, what you would imagine, P0 of E realizes A, and P1 of E realizes B. And this junction, uh, here we make use of um, that we have this primitive apparatus for talking about numbers, and we already used the, the apparatus for pairing and projection. Uh, here we say that the first component has to be a number, and we have two clauses. If the first component is the number zero, uh, then uh, the, the second component it's a realizer for A, and if the first component is not zero, then the second component is a realizer for B. And then with so many things, uh, it's important to check that this commutes with substitution in the relevant sense. So this is something that is is checked right after the definition. Sorry. Yeah. Should you always be, should you also be able to realize the the formula that E realizes A? Um, that's a good it? question. I don't remember. Uh, uh, e R A. Yes. So we use yeah. E R A is not a syntactic thing. It's it is. Right? It's defined by this. Oh yeah, yeah, but you might you might have it's a new formula, and that you can iterate this construction. Uh, so, if A is a formula of E O N, then E R A is a new formula of E O N with a new fresh variable, and you can have E prime realizes E realizes A. Yeah, but you don't have to define. No, you don't have that. That follows from the okay. same principles. Uh, um, is it okay we just say okay. that we treat it as a common formula? If what? If we treat the formula E um, realize A as a topic. Yeah, but okay, so let, let's have a look. There is a discussion about negative formulas. Let's check whether uh, realizers, uh, realizing formulas are negative. Remember, a negative formula is something that does not have an exists or a disjunction on the right side of an implication. So I think this is the case here. We never, there are no exist, existential or disjunctions. Um, anywhere in in a, in E realizes anything, right? So E realizes A is always a negative formula. Uh, so let's just skip. Uh, so this is subsection one point three about self-realizing formulas. Um, so obviously we think of um, realizability as a kind of model. Okay, maybe okay, Egbert. Uh, yeah. It's about the rules, so maybe if you want to yeah. finish our sentence. Okay. okay. Um, so 
Okay, so this is the definition in subsection 1.3. We say a formula is self-realizing if we uh, can find a term that doesn't depend on uh, the parameters of the formula, but of sort of uniformly in the parameters of the formula provides a realizer for it. Okay, and furthermore, uh, it should be the case that if anything realizes this formula, then it's true. So in particular, atomic formula are self-realizing in this case, in this sense. But in, in fact, every negative formula is self-realizing. This is lemma uh, 1.4. And you just make this construction of the uniform realizer by, uh, by recursion on the structure of the formula using the fact that it's negative. So we, we don't encounter the case of an exists or a disjunction, in which case we would have to provide some witnessing information. So otherwise, we can completely uniformly in the parameters realize every self, every negative formula provided it's true, or be equivalent to its truth. Um, so in particular, we just noticed that realizability statements themselves are negative. Uh, so, uh, so, so they're self-realizing. Let me answer your question. Uh, no, I actually already answered this. The answer to my question. Okay. Itself, so. So. But anyway, that was an that was an answer to it. Then. Okay. Because he realizes A is an ah, it's a self realizing yes. formula. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then let's just look through uh, we get to the soundness theorem. Uh, the um, the main version is one point six. If you have a set of formulas gamma. Uh, all of which are provably realized, that is, uh, there are terms such that EON proves that these terms realize them. And suppose you have a derivation from gamma of A. Then you can get a new term, T, such that provably in EON, T is defined and T realizes A. So this is the soundness of the realizability model. Okay? And Let's just have a, so you do the proof by induction on the derivations and you, um, so in this case we take derivations in a Hilbert style sense and then we uh, provide realizers for uh, all the, uh, the, um, uh, the axioms and we talk about what happens at the rules and if you've ever programmed in any constructive um, system or worked with say Cock or Lean or Acta, you're quite familiar with uh, proving that uh, axioms of intuitionistic logic and provable, for, provable formulas in intuitionistic logic are realizable by writing a lambda term, which you could then interpret as a term in any PCA using the abstraction algorithm. So uh, it's a clear connection between working in a type theory and uh, proving things uh, realizable. But it's not equivalent, but it's certainly seems familiar when you think about the proof of what's going on here. Okay. So then there's a, a section two, which the main idea is how do we use realizability to get consistency results? So this you know, it's an important thing to understand that if um, because um, we have the um, uh, any because uh, the underlying model of uh, model of UN is a PCA. Um, if uh, if you have a model of EON and something is provably realized in EON, then that formula is realized in the model just by sound by being a model. So, in particular, by taking so in this theorem 2.1, taking A to be a falsehood and taking a statement you're interested in uh, in gamma, then if you could derive a contradiction from that thing, then you would have that uh, the, 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 uh, the atomic formula false would be realizable in a model, but that never happens. So hence, if that if something uh, is has a realizer in some model of UN, then it's consistent with UN. Okay. 
So that is then used in section three, where a, a consistency with EON of a bunch of principles are derived. So first, um, we note that there is a realizer of CT, hence CT is consistent with EON. And what is the realizer of EON, uh, of CT? Well, it's almost the identity, but it's, uh, you have to, uh, uh, you have to use a search. Uh, you have to use uh, the search operator in uh, Cleanis model. So this, is, we, we note that CT is recursively realized. It's re realizable in K1, Cleanis first model, and hence it's consistent because we have the search operator in K1. And the second point is um, Markov's principle. Uh, every instance of Markov's principle is, uh, is recursively realized. And again, the argument uh, is not too hard again, because we, when we talked about the informal interpretation of Markov's principle, we noted that you could make a search. And here, this is a formalized version of this, that a search uh, realizes um, Markov's principle. OK? Um, so that's corollary three. You also realize the axiom of choice for negative formulas, precisely because negative formulas are self-realized. So here, in fact, we don't even have to look at a particular model. We, we get that the axiom of choice for negative formula is self, as provably realized in any model of EONs, provably realized. And the same thing with the axiom of dependent choices. Uh, OK. And then, so that's, I guess that's the main meat of what we get out of uh, this realizability interpretation here. We'll get more out uh, maybe some other time, but it's the main thing right now. Uh, let's look at a couple of the exercises. Are all combinations of those also perfectly realized? Not, uh, I mean, some of them were only realized in K1, mm -hmm. right? But it is true that if, if I mean, if you have a, some things that are realized in K1 and something that are provably realized. And of course, everything that's provably realized is also realized in every model. So all those things we just mentioned are reali recursively realized. And hence, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. since there's one model in which they're all recursively realized, then they're consistent. Okay. Uh -huh. So let's look at exercise number four. Um, here, we are to prove that LPO, the limited principle of omniscience, which says that for any operation from n to n, you can decide either that there is a point at which it's non-zero or that it's zero for all arguments. And we are to prove that it's not recursively realized, and hence, it cannot be derived from EON, because if it was provable, then by soundness of realizability, it would be provably realized, hence it would be recursively realized. Okay. So what do you think is an argument for why LPO is not recursively realized? Algorithm, which if you, if you take, uh, gives us input uh, uh, like a program, then you just execute the program like continually outputting zeros, and once the program stops, you have to start outputting ones, something like that. Yeah, I think you could reduce you uh, uh, if from a, yeah, you could reduce a holding problem to a realizer uh, for LPO. Yeah. Okay, okay and. Uh, then another thing I want to point your attention to is exercise 10, 
which is a paradigm of many results in uh, meta mathematics of constructive theory. So this is the characterization theorem for uh, EUN realizability. So it says that if you assume as an axiom the axiom of choice for negative formulas, then any formula is equivalent to the statement that there exists a realizer for it. And furthermore, um, a formula is provably realized if and only if it's derivable in EON together with the axiom of choice. So it precisely characterizes EON provable realizability. So the, the defining principle of it is the axiom of choice for negative formulas. So for many other proof interpretations or interpretations of uh, some system in another, we would like to have a characterization system like that that tells you when the interpretation is equivalent to what you start with, uh, like that. And this is a, a paradigm model, but it's, it's not so hard to, um, to argue for in this case. OK. I'm going to skip a little bit over uh, the discussion in section four, because we already discussed how to derive um, the existence principle and the numerical uh, the disjunction principle um, for something like Heitzing's arithmetic <coughs> using the Kleene slash. And, and for some reason, I mean, it, usually it has, a, it has a bit better properties than Q realizability. But let's just have a look. I mean, Q realizability is uh, one way to prove the existence property and disjunction property. But in, in some sense, um, the clean slash is a little more gives a little bit more information, uh, but it's good to know that there's also this possibility of using Q realizability. Uh, you almost think you could just use re realizability in the way we have here. So um, we know that if you prove an existence statement, then by soundness it is realized. This means that there is a term that real and um, the terms T and Q such that provably T realizes A of Q. But for the existence property to hold, you would actually want to be able to prove A of Q. But that's not what you have uh, because A of Q may not be uh, self-realizable. So you have to change the definition in order to ensure that if something is realized, then it's also provable. If something is provably realized, then it's provable. Okay. So the basic idea is to, at enough places in the definition, uh, ensure that the definition of realizability also ensures truth. Um, so let's see, what are the, the changes we have to make? We have to, or oh, I can actually play with colors here, which is good. Uh, so for exists, um, we have to do, um, not only does P0 of E realize P1 of E, but we have to add on, so we have this part, and actually A of P1 of E. So that's one change. And the other change I, is to be implication. Uh, yeah, so we have to add in the here. If Q realizes A and A, then uh, then the, then the, the right hand side. Yeah. Okay. I think those are the only changes. Is there a change for because we have the, talked about disjunction the way we have? I don't think there's anything. Oh, you no, you do have need to do it for disjunction as well. So. It's not enough to get this. We also want that A actually holds in this case. So and A, and here, and, and B. I think those are all the, the changes we have to make. And then, of course, replace um, the R by Q. OK. So this is. Q realizability. 
and has many of the same properties. We have the soundness. Um, so if something is uh, derivable, uh, then it's probably uh, Q-realized if all the premises are probably Q-realized. And now you get the existence property because um, because now this is sufficient. Uh, well, we, are, we get directly from the definition if we have provable real, uh, realizability of, of, an, of an existence statement. Then we'll just look at that line and we, we get um, P1 of E uh, is the witness such that we can prove A of P1 of E. Can we change R everywhere into Q? Yeah. 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 So the things in red are the additions you have to do to uh, to define Q realizability, and then of course you change globally, everywhere. Globally, globally we've changed the, the Q for R. Yeah. Ah, so uh, yeah. Okay, you should probably also yeah. That's uh, that. That is a uh, that is a uh, cursive Q, whereas the other Q is Roman. How about that? Yeah. Also, that's bound. <laughs> <laughs> so white Q, the other one's red. Yeah, that's another difference. <laughs> Okay, uh, so so this is another way to prove the existence and disjunction properties. Um, and then there's not much left in the chapter. Um, we also get uh, closure under the rule of axiom of choice um, using Q realizability. Uh, and then there's a discussion. I th I think actually I liked uh, I liked so much uh, the. the thing we did with it. So how about we just do it again, and then we can discuss uh, what comes out of the discussion. Does anyone new want to participate? Now we need a pragmatist as well. Pragmatist. You're the pragmatist. <laughs> um, we also need s s skepticus and significus. And let's see, do we need anyone There's else? Fyodor for one line. Yeah. One line, Fyodor. OK. OK. Oh, okay, then you can be significant. And I'll do the one line of Fyodor then. Okay? All right. <laughs> Good day, gentlemen. What serious faces you all have. We have been discussing the constructive theory of rules, especially a formal theory EON, which provides for combinators K and N, a predicate for the natural numbers and induction. We were trying to decide if this theory is true of constructive functions, or to put it another way, if the theory is in accordance with the constructive concept of rules. I can imagine how the discussion went between you two. You are always arguing because you both think there is just one true constructive mathematics. Well, how could two different versions of mathematics be true? I like to think of constructive mathematics as a sort of high-level programming language. Bishop, 1976. <laughs> <laughs> uh, appendix B, Martin Love, 1992. Let me draw you a diagram. Proof of a theorem in a box. Double arrow. Compiler in a box. Double arrow. Program realizing the proof. <laughs> Bishop always used to say that every theorem comes down in the end to a statement that certain computations on the integers will have certain results. In short, every theorem has a numerical meaning. Every constructive proof can be compiled to, a, to produce a program which will carry out the re relevant computations. For example, if we prove for every x there exists a y, such that y squared is x for complex numbers y and x, the proof should be uh, should compile to produce a numerical routine for finding the square root of a complex number. This is an old and interesting idea. In fact, it was initiated by Cantor about a hundred years ago. Uh, should I read the exact quotation in the <laughs> You can do it in, yeah, if you want. Okay, uh, I will do the translation. Okay. Uh, if only the natural numbers are real and everything else nothing more than forms of expression, then the theorems of analysis 
should be tested according to their number theoretic content. Okay. Uh, um, he explicitly rejected the idea of limiting the concept of meaning to this sort of numerical meaning. But the idea is still being talked about and may be gaining in popularity these days. But I digress. Did you mean to imply that this has something to do with our discussion on, about EON? Well, my interest in EON has been that it seems like a prototype compiler language for mathematics. The compiler itself could be, for example, realizability. Put the proof P of the theorem A into a compiler, out comes a term T of EON, and the proof that T realizes A. To get an actual program corresponding to A, we interpret T realizes A in some model of Eon. For example, if A is the theorem that every complex number has a square root, the result will be a routine that accepts as inputs a recursive index of a complex number X and outputs a recursive index of the square root of X. This is clear enough. But you were originally going to explain how two views of mathematics could be both true. We won't let you change the subject and brush off our discussion. <laughs> My dear sir, have patience. <laughs> I am going to show you that a given theorem A does not have any single meaning. First of all, there is the problem of exactly how the proof of A is uh, to be compiled. Realizability isn't the only choice, you know. Even for arithmetic, we could choose to compile via the Gödel interpretation as Bishop advocated, or by any of the infinitely many interpretations discovered by Stein and Diller. But suppose we have fixed the choice of our compiler, <coughs> which will reduce the logical structure of our theorem to corresponding operations. The results should be Input data arrow programming realizability theorem arrow output asserts to exit uh, to exist by the theorem. Okay. <clears throat> Keep the simple example of uh, square roots of uh, complex numbers in mind. Note that there are several ways in which the data might be represented for input or output. If we use realizability in the model of partial recursion functions, we will get the routine mentioned above. A more natural routine from the numerical analysis point of view might be a program that accepts rational approximations to x and outputs rational approximations to a square root of x. Someone with another kind of interest in the problem might want a program that accepts as input a proof in some form of system that x is a uh, complex number and outputs y expressed in the same system, along with the proof that y squares x. All these are different possible ways of assigning numerical meaning to the theorem that every complex number has a square root, who is to say uh, which, if any, is the true meaning of the theorem. None of these are the true meaning of the theorem. They are simply alternative interpretations which happen to preserve the formal rules of the given system or in the case of your square root example, the truth of the given theorem. It is exactly analogous to asking which of the many models of H A omega is the true or intended model. The effectiveness, there are the effective operations, the countable functionals, or the recursively countable functionals, or the hereditarily recursively countable functionals, or what? Um, of course, all of them are just formal models. The intended model of constructive functions is not formally defined, yet every constructivist knows what it is. Of course, it's just the effective operations. All rules are recursive. Of course, it's the constructive functions as I described them. And neither of these two answers agrees with your opinion, Significus. So it seems that not every constructivist has the same idea about the true or intended model even of the arithmetic of finite types. I maintain that you three ought to give up your fixed ideas about some absolute truth in mathematics. You do not, however, offer us any coherent philosophy of mathematics, which we might consider on its merits. On the contrary, your hay-necked 
phrases <laughs> about numerical meaning might apply as well to the classical numerical analysis. According to you, a purely universal statement such as Goldbach's conjecture of the form for all n R n with R recursive has no numerical meaning at all. Yet surely any coherent philosophy of constructive mathematics must distinguish between constructive and non-constructive proofs, even of such things. Any attempt to explain the constructive content of statement of such statements will lead you into the same discussion of the concept of rule, in which you find us engaged when you arrive. Well, I admit that's a difficult point. I don't claim to be able to explain the meaning, numerical or otherwise, of proofs I haven't seen yet. But I can recognize a proof with a numerical meaning when I see one. <laughs> Uh, we seem to have reached an impasse, and it's getting late. If we climb that hill, we'll be just in time to watch the sunset. Will you join me? <laughs> Yay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, what do you take from that? Any, any thoughts? It's getting late. <laughs> it's getting late, yeah. Well, I like the idea of recognizing a proof. I see one. Yeah, it's like, uh, like the Supreme or, Court. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, like the fact that Lean recognizes proof when a different one. <laughs> what about the example of the existence of square roots of complex numbers? What do you think about that example? Is that a good example? I wasn't sure how the numerical thing was supposed to fit in that. Well, I, I, I must admit, I didn't thoroughly prepare but, uh, at this point. But I believe if you look at the, some models where uh, the things you prove exist are continuous in the parameters, then you're getting going into have, you're going to have some trouble with the square root because it's not continuous on all the uh, there's no continuous square root function, so, um, so I doubt that it's actually provable in this. I mean, I don't know exactly how he went to formalize the statement in EON, but it might not be provable as stated. It might be provable for a certain subset of the complex numbers if you cut out, uh, yeah, something like that. Then it might be provable. Yeah, there's no total total function on the uh, complex number. But it might exist on oh, another Riemannian manifold. Yeah, of course. There's a Riemannian manifold you get by taking two copies yeah. of the complex plane and gluing them. But then that's not the complex plane. That's a, another Riemannian manifold. Yes, but, yep. that's, but that will be discovered. Yes, that will be discovered <laughs> when you try to prove <laughs> this <laughs> constructively. <laughs> then. Yes. Okay, so that, that was one thought. Um, how about this, uh, the, la the last point? Um, that uh, uh, is it true that there can be uh, a difference between a constructive proof and a non-constructive proof of a purely universal statement? How would you know? Do you know of an example of that? What do you mean by purely universal in this case? Uh, in the same sense as here, purely universal in the sense of all n and then something recursively checkable. Say primitive recursively checkable. Does it sometimes happen that you don't prove that there doesn't exist in that example? But uh, for a statement of this form, a counter example, what would be a counter example? Why do you. Uh, uh, well, I just. Well, I mean, that if, uh, if there's a classical proof. Yeah. Then there's That's right. For for almost, I think we for all the formal this goes systems. A lot harder. Yeah. Yes. For all the systems we know, if there is a classical proof, then there is a constructive proof of uh, formulas for, in for this, for this uh, class of formulas. Yeah. yeah. Even if your classical proof uses all kinds of classical actions like actual choice, uh, large cardinal yeah. actions, whatever, yeah. I mean, um, those are probably not. Well, for for it, there might be some some case where, where you use something that's proof theoretically very strong, like large cardinals. You you might uh, be wary of having a constructive counterpart for those. 
So that's something, that's a place where I can see that there might be a difference. You might need something uh, of great proof theoretic strength. But if it's something for which we have a constructively comparable theory, then there shouldn't be any difference between. Is that theorem that you mentioned, is that a constructed theorem or a classic theorem? Uh, this is very constructive. Okay, so, so you can uh, transform any so proof. You can into, write your algorithm mm -hmm. and, and compile from your classical proof. Yeah, uh, a constructed proof. Constructed proof, and what's the runtime of this for a simple thing? Um, is, is it terrible it, or is it? Okay. I think it's okay. okay. Um, there are some some transformations that require exponential blow up, but it is even for a phi zero proof. Set. So you can yeah. blow up in the for all x there exists a y, and then a phi of three. Yes, there, and but then it's still true. Then it's still true, but then I think there's some complexity uh, Issue. issues. Yeah, because. Uh, uh, are you talking about the Yeah, okay. pi of zero one. Yeah. But pi zero one, oh, I should have looked this up, but uh, I don't believe that there is a much of a complexity penalty. But we can, we'll try to find out for next time. Okay, any other thoughts? All right, maybe we should uh, walk off into the sunset and uh, <laughs> meet again next next week. So I'll stop the uh, broadcasting. <laughs>